Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Today I'm looking at a brand new loco from Helgen. I would say that the last couple of new locos I tried from Helgen were much better than normal in terms of quality. So today I've decided to spin the Helgen wheel again and try another one of their new locos. Today then I'm looking at this, it's the all new Class 45 or Peak as they were also known from Helgen. Now I have got a Class 45 in my collection already and it's behind me over there, that's the Backman one. Very lovely loco, but it dates back a good number of years. So I'm thinking there should be plenty of room for improvement on that old Backman Peak. And hopefully that is where this new Helgen loco comes in. So the RRP for this is £189.99, which is definitely up there, isn't it? I bought mine from a retailer Hattons for £160.65. So yeah, a little bit cheaper than the Acura scale locos that I've been looking at, but not by an awful lot. So the expectations for this are relatively high. But if it's well detailed, if it's good quality, if it runs nicely, if the mechanism is good, then this could definitely be a great value loco. But for now, I'm going to stop talking about it and we're going to find out for sure. So here we go, Helgen's brand new Class 45. So I'm fairly sure that this is a new packaging design, at least to me. I'm sure the packaging has been slimmed down quite a bit for this loco, and that's probably a response to the increased shipping costs, probably. So this should have saved a little bit of money, and that's fine, I think, provided the loco is still well protected inside. Hopefully it will be. The front of the box has this nice line drawing of the locomotive on it doesn't really give away much in terms of livery and incidentally there's quite a lot of choice in terms of the different versions of this model you can get from Helgen and if you're interested in those I will include an affiliate link in the description so you can browse the range. In terms of what I've got though let me show you this end of the box so I've got product code 45100 it is a BR Green class 45 D31 it is DCC ready, it has a 21 pin socket inside, it's got interior and exterior lighting, sprung buffers, which I like very much, NEM couplings apparently, and ERA 5, so we've even got the ERA on there. Doesn't mention whether there are any DCC sound speakers pre-fitted into this loco, so that's a question for later on, I suppose. Anyway, relatively simple packaging design apart from that, so let's get in and let's see what's cracking off inside. Okay, so we've got a booklet here. I like the look of this. Uh, the last Helgen Loco I looked at, the ES1 had a nicely produced booklet inside and that was good to see. So, let's open it up. So, we've got a little bit of information, well I say a little bit, quite a lot actually, on the Class 45 in real life. So if you want to pause and read that, feel free to. Oh, we've got a list of parts here, quite a lot of them actually. It doesn't show everything in terms of the mechanism, but uh, yeah, there's some sort of parts list there anyway. All right, servicing and DCC information. So the first thing is removing the body, and apparently this is held together with screws, not just clips. So that sounds like a quality solution. Converting to digital, that seems very simple. Light functions, so obviously you can control the lights with DCC, or if you're on analog like me, there are there's at least a couple of switches some of those switches are magnetic by the looks of things, that's the cab lights, yeah, the directional cab lights. So apparently there's a magic wand included to enable customizability over that feature, so that's interesting. Technical data, we've got a 12 volt motor with twin flywheels, that sounds great. Three axles powered per bogey, so that means all of the wheels except for those leading ones. Wiper pickups on six axles, so again it's just the driving wheels that pick up then. Control system, blah, 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 yeah, that's fine. Basic lighting functions, optional detail parts. Uh, yep, yeah, you've got a picture there to sort of illustrate some of those and a little bit of instructional material on how to fit them. And then on the back, uh, it's just some general information. Looks like it's supposed to run on radius two curves, so that's fairly standard. Right. Let's have a look at the loco then. The packaging seems to be good, actually. Um, quite thin, yeah, this foam is a lot thinner than we've seen from other manufacturers, and uh, same on the sides, but 
hopefully this will have been packaged properly in the container or whatnot so that it's uh, good and safe and in good condition let's pull it out then let's see oh it's heavy yeah right let's delve in then let's see what we get you can see the accessories through the top so we'll have a look at that first this is an interesting one so this must be the magic wand for operating the cab lights. Uh, it's just a piece of plastic with a magnet in the end. But this is the first time I've seen this feature on a diesel. Yeah, that's quite clever actually. A nice way of allowing cab lights to be enabled and disabled. Because obviously it's actually not prototypical for the cab lights to be on while a loco is running. And on analog, in many cases, there is no way to easily customise that. Sometimes you'll get switches at best, but sometimes you don't. That's quite cool. Well done, Helgen. I like the sound of that. Right, let's see what's in this accessories bag then. All right, so we've got the bits and bobs that were outlined in that diagram. Yeah, I can see the usual buffer beam parts. There's sort of sand pipes. There's both couplings, and this is not a resealable bag. So actually, to get the couplings, I'm going to have to cut this bag open and uh, unleash all of these detail parts, which is unfortunate. But there are some screw link couplings in there, which is good. That's a great feature. And some of the detail parts in there are etched as well. So there's a sense of quality here, which is good too. All right, let's open it up. Let's have a look. We're going to get our first look at the finish any second. Let's unwrap. Mm, oh, interesting. Okay. So there's quite some detail up on the roof there. Uh, the finish at the moment looks to be quite flat, quite matte really, but uh, we'll have a better look at that in a moment when, uh, when we look at the side of the body. Right, let's see what the weight's like. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's fairly heavy actually. Yeah, certainly a good bit of weight to this. And here it is. It's got some sort of support in the centre here. Yeah, now that's screwed on. Uh, so the full reveal you'll have to wait for. But yeah, the finish, mm, little bit matte, I would say. The last few diesels and electrics I've looked at have had a real sort of sleek satin finish, which has made them look quality. This one, it's not terrible, it's not completely flat or anything, but it looks a little bit on the plasticky side, doesn't it? There's definitely some decent moulded detail on there, though. I will show you some more of this in just a second. First of all, though, here's a bit of background on the peak in real life. The British Rail Class 45, or the Sulzer Type 4, was introduced in 1960 when the first of 127 locomotives entered traffic, having been constructed at Derby Works. The class played a key role in replacing the final steam locomotives still in service, and was faster, more efficient, and offered greater acceleration than basically any of them. The Class 45 featured a Sulza 12-cylinder engine capable of delivering 2,500 horsepower, and interestingly the same engine would be used in quite a few other locomotives, such as the later Class 25s from the following year, except they just had 6 cylinders instead of 12. The class even had steam heating boilers when first introduced, so as to heat passenger carriages, although this system was eventually replaced with an electric one in the 1970s in select locos. The peaks, as they were also known, were heavily used until the introduction of the HSTs, when they began to be gradually relegated to lighter duties, before being more or less completely withdrawn by 1986. Today, 11 remain in preservation, while the rest, sadly, were scrapped. So there it is, the new Helgen Class 45, up close and personal for you. And yeah, I think this is okay. I'm, I'm trying to be objective about it, but I just, I'm not 100% keen on it, if I'm honest with you. I think, ultimately, we've been spoiled by the likes of Acura Scale and Backman, because when I opened those last few locos, the Class 37 from Backman, the 92 and the 55 from Acura Scale, I was physically excited by those locos. They blew me away. This one, there's nothing particularly wrong with it or anything, but I'm just not feeling that impressive factor from it. And there isn't one specific issue with it or anything like that. I think it's just a number of things that maybe place this a few steps behind the likes of Backman and Acura Scale now. First of all, obviously you saw that there was quite a lot of extra detail to fit in the accessories pack. 
and the reasons for a lot of those parts not being fitted at the factory do seem to be valid. There are some parts such as the sandboxes that go on the bogies that were eventually removed, so they haven't fitted those to give you the chance of not fitting them. But uh, yeah, we've just got four holes instead on each bogey now, uh, which don't exactly look great. So if that's not prototypical for your particular model, if you don't want to fit those, you've got holes. There are other parts, such as the steam heat pipes, which it just says on the instructions for static display models only. So if you actually want to use your loco, is, is that it? End of story. You don't get those details. It's just a pity there was no way to compromise on that to still bring those details and have the loco work. So as a result, without the accessories fitted, it does look quite naked in places. Also, yeah, the finish isn't as good as we've seen on other locos. If I show you the Backman Class 37, that was a recently tooled loco, you can see the finish just makes that loco pop. And we don't have that with this, it just looks kind of plasticky. The decoration leaves a fair bit to be desired as well. There are a few places where the paint just doesn't look fantastic, as you can see. This axle box looks really bad. I reckon somebody must have caught that before it was dried. You can see there's a bit of overspray on it and a lot of the paint has just come off. The British Railways crests, they just don't look great, do they, anymore? If I show you one on the Backman, this is a new Backman Loco, class 24. It looks way, way better than this one from Helgen. The detailing is relatively simplistic as well. I mean, some of the grills are just molded into the bodywork, but some of them are actually separately fitted parts, which I wasn't expecting. They are, however, just made of plastic. They're not etched. So they do lack that depth that you get from the proper etched grills. Although the quality of the molding has to be said, it's very high. You've got the handrails around the cabs, which are just made of plastic and they look quite chunky compared with photos of the real thing. And this isn't helped by the fact that they haven't been cut particularly accurately from the sprues because there's quite a bit of excess plastic visible on those and one of them over here is even bent. And then you've got stuff like this on the axle box. This piece is just not connected to anything. Is that... I'm not an expert on the peak. Is that how it would have been? Would that have just been dangling like that? Yeah, I'm just not really feeling it with this one. The weight comes in at 563 grams, which is fine. You know, that's plenty heavy enough, but it is lighter than the Backman Peak, which goes back a good few years. It's a good 100 grams lighter than Acura Scale's new Class 92, and it's 200 grams lighter than the Acura Scale Class 55. Again, not a massive deal, but it's still a couple of steps behind those other manufacturers. And then when I consider the price, this is 189.99 RRP or £160 thereabouts at the retailers. It's not really that much cheaper than some of the other locos I've been describing. So the value for money doesn't seem to be too great. But let's talk about some of the things the loco does have. The join between the body and the roof is reasonably clean, I would say. And the colour certainly looks good. It matches other locos in the collection and it seems to match the colour of the photos I've seen online. Little plates on here, but again, you can't read those. On a lot of new tooled locos, you can now read that sort of text, but here it's just a little bit of a blur. The bogey detail looks good, and much of the detail here is actually separately fitted, so all of these springs, I believe, are separate parts, which is quite good to see. They stand out beautifully as a result. And we have got some separately fitted steps and such. The trailing and leading axles look very strange. It almost looks like there's a piece missing from the axle box of those wheels, but no, that is how the real thing looked. It just wasn't ever represented like that on the older Backman Peak, so that is quite interesting to see. The ends of the locomotive are quite detailed. You've got these wire handrails on the end, which are very, very fine. The buffer beams are quite detailed, but again, they're just poorly painted. You can see the black through the red in a number of areas, and you can see the red through the black where parts are supposed to be black. It just doesn't have the same finesse that we've seen from other manufacturers. But there is a fair bit of detail here, as you can see, but hopefully not so much as to foul the loco as it runs along. The NEM pocket does seem to be reasonably clear, and there are separately fitted metal sprung buffers. So that's a good quality feature, sprung and metal buffers. It's very good. The cabs look fine as well. In fact, the cabs are quite a strong area of this loco. The glazing is nice and flush. You've got what look like separately fitted metal wipers, and those do seem to be quality parts. And the cab interiors are very well detailed. You've got print work on the back wall of the cabs. 
And in this area, yes, this is very much at the same standard that we've seen from Backman and Acura Scale recently, which is good. Up on top, there is a lot of detail, much of this separately fitted. And the way that most of this detail is separately fitted is great. There's very little glue visible. I think there's one splodge on the loco that I've seen, but that's not too bad. There is what looks like an etched grill above the fan of the loco. You can unfortunately see wires and plugs underneath that fan. Again, that spoils the realism of it a little bit, but overall, not bad at all. So the Loco's not bad by any means. I just think it could have been painted better, the finish could have been better, and perhaps the design of some of the details could have been improved so that more of it could have been fitted to the models at the factory. But besides that, yeah, the quality is fair. The weight is okay, if not super impressive. And at least this Loco wasn't up and above the 200 pound mark. At least it only cost me 160 pounds. Whether that's cheap enough for me to overlook some of the issues with it, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's a rip-off at the moment. But we need to get this down onto the track. Let's see how it runs. Let's have a look at the mechanism and see if there's a bit more quality in there. So there it is, the peak down onto the track, and the first performance test has already been filmed. I'll save that as a surprise. I'll show you that in just a moment, but you can probably guess how it went. Next, I went and did a look at the mechanism, and you probably will be surprised to hear what I'm going to say next, but that is that the, the mechanism is great. Yeah, the quality is really good. It's a sensible design. It's easy to service. Helgen have clearly really, really listened to feedback here and made some changes for the best. So let's start looking at this. Um, first of all, I was a bit concerned by this front axle design. It's got quite a few moving parts to it and a lot of movement as well. It's also sprung, so it stays on the track, but it, it does the job. It does actually work well, so that is a good design. The base keeper plate is still clipped in place, it's not screwed on, but this time the clips are very easy to access and they're extremely easy to overcome. So actually accessing the axles is easy to do this time. And here's a surprise, bearings. Yep, we have proper turned metal bearings on the driving axles. So finally, we can welcome Helgen to the bearings club. The exclu Well, no, it's not exclusive, everybody's in the club, but Helgen is now part of that club as well. Great quality feature, really pleased that Helgen have listened to feedback. Next, the body removal requires the removal of screws. So the body's not just clipped on, we've got actual screws, which is an easy and long lasting solution. That's very good. Inside we've got the heavy die cast chassis, which is where most of the weight comes in because the loco body is largely plastic. You've got the circuit board with the DCC socket built onto it. It's a brilliant white color for some reason, which explains why it was visible from the outside of the loco. That's a strange decision. Can't see any speaker on this loco, unfortunately, but then again, I don't mind that at all because it's reflected in the price. At least here, I'm not paying for a speaker that I'm, I'm not going to use. If you want to chip one of these with sound, then obviously you could buy a speaker, which yeah, is an extra expense at that point, but at least that will be a feature you can use. The cab light boards are part of the chassis, so they're not part of the body. That makes it easy so they can be hardwired. Nice and smart design there. I did notice though that the centrally mounted motor, which does have flywheels on it, was not straightly mounted. It was definitely at an angle. That first flywheel was up in the air and this one is facing downwards. So I did delve inside to just try and straighten that. I found that it was quite free to move. It wasn't really fixed in that position. So I straightened it out, tightened the screws, and I hoped for the best. Shouldn't really try to improve a loco when I'm reviewing it, but I thought, why not? And then the gauging comes in at 14.2 to 14.4 millimeters back to back. That's actually fine, pretty close to the standard. So there's, there's nothing really to complain about. Uh, the slightly wonky motor was a bit of a concern, but that didn't seem to be making any difference. So the mechanism is a big thumbs up. Performance though? Well, let me show you what happened. Moment of truth time. I'm really interested to see how this loco works and also to see whether it can rival those latest locos from Acura Scale and Backman and the like. So forwards direction, we're already set. Let's give this some juice and see if it works. Here we go. Now yeah, that's 50%. And uh, yeah, it's very much come to life. Now, it hasn't been running yet, so obviously not expecting this loco to be 
necessarily at its best yet. I will give it the full 30 minutes in either direction before obviously uh, giving my rating or anything on the performance. But yeah, it seems to start off smoothly. It seems to run quietly. Uh, there's no sign of any hesitation or anything like that. Yeah, that's really good. We've got some lights coming on here. We've got the cab lights coming on in the forwards direction as well as the number boards on the front and then when the loco runs away from you you've got the red tail lights which come on automatically all right that's good what's the torque like i do wonder that so let's stop it i'll put my fingers on the buffers can the loco turn its wheels no it's stone cold dead there and then it accelerates slowly so there's little torque at the moment again that could change as things run in but at the moment poor torque okay let's do a crawl see what that's like straight out of the box i'm just easing it up easing 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 still easing oh there we go well that's not bad yeah that's fine that's not bad at all um it's not terribly slow but for a relatively heavy loco that is quite controlled. Yeah, that's not bad. Not much cogging in this mechanism either. Backwards is even better. Try and give it a bit more. Yeah, that's legitimately a very good crawl, isn't it? Yeah, I like that. So the performance seems good on straight track. I have got questions about those trailing and leading axles. I hope they are going to be stable around various curves and inclines and such. Uh, there's only one way to find out, really, and that is to give the loco a try around the layout. So let's do it. Off she goes. 50% speed. Oof. Slow down a bit entering that curve. Blimey. Let's see if it does it again. Oof. Yeah. So the lack of torque is even showing through in the performance. That's less than impressive isn't it is he going to do it at the top yeah every single curve slows right down but to be fair you know it's only been running for a few seconds at the moment it does need to have a proper run in so i'm going to let it do that um, let's hope things are a lot better after the fact and hopefully after that we'll have a good running loco that is worth 160 to 190 pounds please keep those fingers crossed all right, folks, I am back. And um, that, yeah, it was, I'm not sure quite... Hold on, let's start again. <laughs> okay, folks, that is running in complete. And I'm not too sure where to stand on this. In some ways, yeah, it was a good experience. The Loco never derailed. It was absolutely fine, even with this unusual sort of leading and trailing axle design. Absolutely perfect. No issue with that at all. The curve issue, though, is still a thing. It was slowing down on basically every curve on the layout, and I think, more than anything, it was getting worse as it went. It's also started making a noise when it reaches curves. It's like a metal scraping noise. It sounds like the Tin Man's coming or something. But yeah, it's just, it's not great on curves, and the torque is really poor. And I, I have to be honest to say I don't really know why that is because obviously I looked at the mechanism. To me, it looked like it was good quality. I would suspect the motor, maybe the motor isn't the greatest quality and possibly mine is faulty. I have no way of proving that mine's not faulty or anything. So take this test with a pinch of salt because your mileage might vary. And if you've got one of these, let me know. Have you noticed any torque issues or do you reckon mine is just faulty? I, I don't know. Anyway, I've picked out one of the couplings from the accessories bag and I've fitted it into the bogey here. The coupling is actually fixed into position. It can't pivot in any way, except this does not cause problems. And here's why. The actual frame of the bogey is free to move independently from the wheels. Now, I don't know if that has been designed with the coupling in mind or whether that's just a byproduct of the general design, but it does mean that that coupling can move left and right as it goes round curves with rolling stock coupled. It's also this movement that makes the tin man noise, as I'm calling it. You hear that? And I, I don't know, folks. I don't know what's causing it. It sounds like it could be pickups moving against the wheels. Honestly, at this point, I'm, I just I, I don't know. I'm trying to be nice about this loco, but really it's just not doing it for me. 
The pulling power is not very good. Yeah, there's no torque there, like I say. 0.38 newtons. The DAPOL Class 59 that I reviewed some time ago was about two and a half times stronger than this Loco. So some sort of torque issue. It could be by design, could be by faulty motor. I'm not sure. But to demonstrate it to you, I've set up seven coaches, not a huge number of those. The ones at the front there have the modern Hornby tension locks, so they should be compatible. But let me first show you the performance now. It's still nice and smooth, I have to say. And while the bogeys are not moving around on the straight, it's free from all of that horrible Tin Man noise that I've noticed. I'm sorry, I need to keep mentioning uh, my little Tin Man analogy there. It's getting weird. But yeah, it is perfectly smooth. Uh, let's see if the torque's any better. I mean, I doubt it because it wasn't a second ago, but let me do it on camera. Let's turn it up to 50. Yeah, it's not even close. Let's keep going until it... Right, so its wheels are starting to turn now at speed 70 out of 100. But even there, it's struggling. It's got a bit more. Yeah, and at full speed, it can actually turn them. But yeah, it's just not a powerhouse, unfortunately. Let's see what the crawl's like, though, because that was at least good. And generally, it is smooth. Yeah, it's a smooth loco. Those flywheels obviously do it proud. And the bearings, you would think, would reduce the amount of friction in the system. So I wouldn't have said it's the bearings to blame. But yeah, look at that. It's odd that it's got such control at the low end. And how about the other way? Yeah, so the performance is good in areas and appalling in others. So it's strange to see the Loco being both of those things at the same time. There we go. It's amazing. There we go. A bit faster. Smooth acceleration. So to an extent, the performance is good. It's just that torque problem. <laughs> it's appalling. Right, let's go and couple up to the coaches. And uh, yeah... Not got a good feeling about this. Oh, I'm quite confident I can do this smoothly, although I did nearly crash there, didn't I? Let's go a bit further. Apparently if a loco doesn't stop before coaches in real life and it couples straight into them, that is considered a collision. So I'm glad I didn't do that. Um, no, that was fine though, wasn't it? Coupling looks like it's perfectly at the right height, so that's another improvement. Yeah, no shoddy coupling design this time. Let's move off. 50% speed this time. Right, on the middle line I have my Backman Peak, which is admittedly less finessed and less detailed, but it runs better. It can crawl just as well, but it is, I think, smoother, it's more consistent at all speeds, and it certainly doesn't slow down on the curves and such. So that is still my favourite in terms of performance. And then on the inside line I've got the new Backman Class 37, which is more along the lines of what I was expecting from this new Class 45 in terms of the finish, the detail, and the quality and such. Uh, this one's not actually an amazing performer. It, the torque of this one's not fantastic, but it's not as bad as the, the peak, at least in my experience. Wow, well, look at that thing. Absolute powerhouse at 50% speed. Here comes the Elgin. Straight into that curve, slow down. Oh, scraping noises, slowing right down. <laughs> yeah. Not too impressed, really, folks. Uh, it's all right. It's not a horrible loco, but the way it's performing is not right. Oh, ground to a halt. Yeah, at this point, it's touch and go whether I'm actually going to keep this or return it. I'm definitely leaning more in the direction of faulty than just underpowered. And, uh, yeah, I'm not sure this was really worth my money. Let's give it a nudge and carry on. I'm trying not to be nasty or anything about this, but, frankly, we've moved on from the sort of locomotive that Helgen is producing. When you look at what Backman and Acura Scale are releasing now for largely similar amounts of money, they just offer more in basically every area, and needless to say, they work a lot better than this as well. So I, I probably will return this. Yeah, I really would rather have the money than the Loco, which is very rarely true. I, you know, I love my Locos. I enjoy collecting them, whether they're good or bad. But this one just seems like a bit of a waste. It's just not doing it for me. 
Um, but let's see, let's see what the pros and cons are. So the pros are it's sort of inexpensive. It's not a bargain or anything, but it's cheaper than some, that's true. Uh, the level of detail is an improvement over the old Backman Peaks, that's true as well. The downside is obviously the performance. It might be that mine's faulty, but certainly mine is not performing well. Yeah, the finish, the build quality is not the greatest either. Uh, but then the mechanism is a bit of a pro as well. So I think your mileage might vary on this. I would look at other reviews, figure out whether this performance is common or not. It might be different on DCC. That's another point. It might be worth putting a, a decoder in there and trying it, seeing if it's any different. But on analog, on the same tests that I subject every loco to, it is not performing well. All right, I've sped it up now to, I think, 70, I think I set it to on the controller. So it's obviously a lot faster now. And now up here, it's having enough momentum to get itself up this hill. So again, I'm just, I'm not sure. I think if there was an issue with the motor, it wouldn't be able to do this, surely. I'm not sure. I might also try it on my Hornby feedback controller, see how it goes with feedback, maybe. Right, so it's now running on my Hornby HM2000. And the slowdowns on the curves are much less noticeable now. So if you've got a feedback controller, you should be all right. But then again, it's not really good enough, is it? Because in the world of cordless motors, we can't always use feedback controllers. And it's a bit unreasonable to expect people to have an HM2000 around whenever you want to run your Helgen Class 45 or those other locos that are too weak to work on a non-feedback controller. Let's have some ratings then for the new peak locomotive from Helgen. Yeah, I'm not dreadfully keen on this one. It's not particularly egregious in any area, but it doesn't really do much to impress either. The level of detail for me has to be three star. It does have some good details on it. It's got the sprung buffers, very detailed buffer beams, great cab interior. So it definitely gets some marks for that, but it loses marks for the finish, which I think is quite plasticky. The decoration isn't the greatest. The British Railways crest in particular doesn't look great. And a lot of the detailing parts were not fitted at the factory. So you've got a loco that looks a little bit naked in areas. You can improve that by fitting some of the details in the accessories bag, but you can only fit some of those parts and still be able to run the loco. The performance for me is a four star, which might seem a little bit generous, but I will explain. Yeah, down at the crawl, it's very, very good and smooth. On straight track, it is nice and smooth. It does slow down very, very dramatically on the bends though, due to a lack of torque, and this is why it loses a star. I'm not marking it down for its lack of pulling power here because there is a separate power category where it will lose marks for that. So the pulling power, 0.38 newtons or 24 coaches on straight and level track, that is. Bear in mind, if you hook this up to 24 coaches, I wouldn't expect the Loco to actually be able to move. That's less than an H2 Atlantic, and it's even less than a Backman 94XX pannier tank. Your mileage might vary on this. Maybe there's a faulty motor in my example, but that is how mine ran. The mechanism though, I am not gonna fault. I'm gonna give it five star. It's accessible. A lot of it is held together with screws, not just clips. It's got proper bearings on the driving axles. The non-driven axles are a good design, I think. It's got pickups on nearly all of the loco wheels, which is great. Decent sized motor in there. Not sure if it's three or five pole, but I'm not gonna knock it down. It does at least have the massive flywheels. I'm not gonna knock it down for the fact that the motor wasn't fitted in straight because I think I've been suitably harsh elsewhere on this loco. So here I'm gonna be slightly generous because I don't really know what a difference that will have made. When I fixed the problem, nothing changed in the performance. So yeah, it is a five star mechanism, clear evidence that Helgen have listened to feedback and tried to improve the quality of their mechanisms. And I definitely wanna reflect that in this review. The quality then for me is three star. There are issues with this one. The quality of the paint is not great. Quite a few blips in that. The finish, like I've already said, is not fantastic. And the, the weight isn't that great either. I don't think there's a massive issue with the weight, but it's not the big heavy loco that you might expect these days. 
That said, a lot of the detail that was applied was done nicely. The amount of visible glue was kept down to a minimum. One or two slight glue splodges I did spot, but nothing too crazy here. So yeah, I've given it a three star. It's kind of middle of the road. I think the value for money is middle of the road as well. I've given it three star. It is cheaper than quite a few, but then again, it is quite simple and of a slightly questionable quality. So it's not a ripoff or anything, but it is cheaper for a reason and possibly the Loco is cheaper in its features than it ought to be at £160. Overall then that is 6.41 out of 10, definitely mixed feelings on this one. That's a grade E and into the logbook it goes, 7th place below the Hornby Triang Victorian set. Yeah it's okay, it's slightly better in detail than the Backman Peak but the old Backman Peak still wins on performance. So it really depends on what you're looking for. If you want a detailed peak that looks accurate, this might be your best bet. If you want a good runner, I would still say Backman. Right, let's try the current draw, see what that's like. So it's 50% on a non-feedback controller. It's about 135 milliamps. It's stable, it's not too high. So that's normal, that seems normal. So. If I had to guess, in my opinion, it's just a bad quality motor rather than a faulty one. I don't know that for sure. I haven't done any diagnostics, but that's my opinion. Yeah, just not a lot of talk there. What if I put it, what if I put my finger against one of the wheels? See now under load, that's not so normal, 300 milliamps. And under stall, it's kind of more like 400. It's quite easy to stop the wheels though. Yeah, I don't know. Could be faulty, it could be. Please do let me know what your experience with this Loco is. So yeah, overall, I'm not too impressed with my model. I think if the quality was a little bit better, if the paintwork was better and the finish was better, and possibly an improved motor was fitted, then I would say this was passable and fair value for money. Otherwise though, yeah, it's, it's not really my cup of tea. So let me know what you think. Uh, do you think this is an acceptable loco for the money? Do you think not? Have you got one of these? Is your experience different from mine? Uh, if so, please do let me know in the comments. I'd be very interested to know. For now though, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the review regardless. Always interesting to look at a new loco, regardless of how good or bad it is. So I hope you enjoyed that at least. But for now folks, thanks for watching. I'll catch you very soon. All right, cheers folks, take care.